So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you with a please a big Taronga warm welcome and a round of applause, Dr. Sean Hendy. Well, th thanks very much, uh, Joe, for having me along. Um, it, it's fantastic to be down in Tauranga. The, I, this is probably only the second or third time I've been down here, um, uh, which, is a, which is a real shame, especially when you put on weather like today, which I'm assured it's like every day. Um, so, so fantastic to be here. And, and such a great turnout as well. Um, and, and, you know, there are still some seats up the front if you guys, but you guys kind of look like you're standing at the bar back there, and probably, I guess you can get to the bar still um, during the talk. So look, I, I'm, I'm going to be talking um, uh, uh, about the contents of, of a book that, that came out late last year. Um, this is a book I, I co-wrote with um, the late Sir Paul Callaghan, uh, it's called Get Off the Grass, and it's really about uh, the direction, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, I can see it's... There's going to be a sweet spot, I'm sure, where I can stand, where I won't, I won't get feedback. But it's, 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 it's about where New Zealand's economy has been, um, where it is now, where it's going, um, and, and what we need to do to keep it going. Um, because the world's actually, you know, it's, 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 it's changing, and, and the things that, are, that are, were valuable 100 years ago are no longer the things that are valuable today. And we have to react uh, to, to the way that uh, the... Way that the um, uh, the world's economy has developed, and, and this may, ne may mean that we have to change the, t the, the ways that we work and the ways that we innovate. So, so of course, my, unfortunately, my, my co-author, Sir Paul Callaghan, I don't know, many people may have seen Sir Paul talk, one of the best public speakers um, I've ever seen. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, uh, several years ago after a, after a battle with cancer, and we were only about halfway through the book pro project when he died, um, so he didn't get to see the, the, the finished product, um, but I can highly recommend, there's still a lot of um, YouTube videos of, of Paul um, and his message out there, highly recommend having a look at these. Um, so if you want to sort of see Paul's take on what I'm going to talk about tonight, then, then go watch him on YouTube. He's an absolutely um, spellbinding speaker. And of course he, he kicked off a lot of this debate in New Zealand about where our economy should be going a few years ago with his, with his first book, Wool to Wetter, um, where he really... Uh, uh, spelled out his vision for an innovative uh, high technology New Zealand that was less reliant on, on, um, on uh, commodity products. And then um, a few years ago, he, he, he walked into my office and said, you know, actually we should sit down and, and, and try and write something more comprehensive because the, the first book he wrote, Walter Wetter, you know, the first chapter was kind of his vision and then he went around the country and just interviewed people about their vision. So it's a sort of a collection of different points of view. He really wanted to sit down and sort of come up with a, a, a really comprehensive look at the New Zealand economy and really figure out, um, you know, does the economics actually back up um, his, his gut feeling about where the economy should go? Um, so that's, that's what brings me uh, to you today, um, is, is the book Get Off the Grass. Now I'm going to start off, I'm just going to talk a little bit about New Zealand's economic history. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go back 100, 150 years, we'll even go back 700 years, when 800 years ago, when people first arrived uh, here in New Zealand. And, and you know, throughout the, the, you know, there's many peoples that have come to New Zealand uh, uh, over the last few centuries, and actually all of them have been extremely innovative. Um, uh, when, when our first people came to New Zealand, um, they, were, they were using leading-edge technology, their, their navigational skills were unmatched um, in any other part of the world. Um, and the, the sailing technology that, that they were using, you know, it's, it, it's astounding that they were able to, to explore and settle the Pacific uh, uh, very purposefully. And then there was a second people that, that came to New Zealand. And again, at the time that they came here, they were, the, they were the leading innovators in the world. You know, their navigational skills and their ability to, to, to sail around the entire globe was really unprecedented as well. And it was this coming together of these two peoples that actually 100 years ago meant that we were the most innovative country in the world. Um, uh, you can look at this in a number of different ways. Um, one example is, is, the, is the Treaty of Waitangi, actually a very innovative political document. There are very few other countries that have any, uh, anything equivalent to, to the treaty between uh, two founding peoples. And, and actually this stimulated, uh, the, this political innovation, stimulated social innovation. And so, of course, we were the uh, first... Um, a country in the world to give women the vote, and that was something that really came to, came out of this fusion of the, of, of two cultures and this partnership 
uh, between two peoples. And at the same time, we were, we were technologically innovating. Um, so we were the, uh, the first country to really exploit refrigeration to send frozen um, goods, and meat in particular, across the world. Um, and, and 100 years ago, you know, we, were, we were really leading the world in a lot of different ways, socially, polit politically, and technologically. And if you look at the number of patents filed per capita um, 100 years ago, New Zealand was, was ahead of the world. So a whole lot of measures, um, we, were, we were really showing the rest of the world how you do things. Things have, have changed a bit, however, um, and, and this is a plot of, of New Zealand's uh, gross domestic pro uh, product over the last 40 years. I, I like to start it in 1970 because that's when I was born, so I can go back and look and, and, and see you know, where New Zealand's position in the world, in terms of GDP at least, was um, in the 1970s, and you can see that we were, we were not far off countries that we like to compare ourselves. I mean, Australia was a little way ahead. Um, uh, but we weren't far, far behind, you know, and we were comparable to a, uh, to a country like Denmark. But things have kind of changed over the last 40 years. Um, you know, our economy has grown, but actually it's grown at a, at a much slower rate um, than, than uh, a, a lot of other countries. Um, so Australia, of course, we, we all know its economy has, has pulled away from us to the extent that they're now considerably richer um, than we are, at least measured in terms of GDP. Denmark, right, we were almost on a, on a par with Denmark, um, and, and it's accelerated away. A country like Finland um, was, was, was behind us in 1970, um, and they, they passed us in the 1980s, um, and again, they've, they're now right at the, at the, at, in, in that top class of countries um, in, in terms of GDP per capita. And then a country like South Korea, which was an, a very, very poor country, recovering from a uh, from a war, um, has grown very rapidly and, and, you know, a decade ago passed us in terms of GDP per capita. So certainly things have changed. You know, we were, we were, we were um, uh, politically, socially um, and technologically innovative and we were one of the richest countries in the world 100 years ago. But, but thing, things have, um, have not gone as well for us in recent times. And so part of, part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is what I think um, has, has affected us, some of the things that I think have constrained us, and to try and look at, at how we can perhaps lift our growth, growth rate and overcome some of the barriers that, that, um, that now we face. And so, of course, you know, it's election year, um, and, and no doubt um, we'll, we'll be hearing about tax cuts and, and, and whether we should increase tax or increase KiwiSaver um, or what we should be doing about government spending. Um, and, and, you know, this is often something that dominates the debate about the economy in New Zealand. Um, there's, an, there's an assumption that the amount of, the size of the government, the amount of money that the government takes in, is, a, is you know, has a big effect on our, on our economy. And so in New Zealand, it's, the government takes about, about um, uh, 30% um, of, of our economic activity um, in tax revenue. So maybe this, maybe this is an explanation for why we haven't, why, why our economy hasn't prospered. Um, over the last 30, 40 years, well, except for the fact um, that we're actually at the, at the very low end. So when you look at the amount that our government takes in, um, sure, it's a little bit more than, than a country like Korea that's gone, gone past us, but then we look at countries like Denmark and Finland that have pulled away from us, um, and their governments are, are spending almost uh, uh, twice as much in terms of taxes. So it's certainly, you know, it may be that the... the an important factor in an economy, how much government is involved, but it's certainly not, not the only factor because countries that have much larger um, tax takes than ours, um, their, their economies have actually grown much more rapidly than ours. So this is not, certainly not the only explanation. Um, you can also look at things like uh, international property rights. And again, we're, we're rated very highly, right? We're, we're rated amongst the sort of countries that you wanted to be rate, rated near to. So in terms of international property rights, we're sixth equal in the world. Legal and political rights, we're, we're rated number one. Lack of corruption, we're routinely uh, rated number one. Um, and then, you know, free trade, uh, again, we come in in the, in the top six. Um, and so in 2012, we were rated fifth equal in the world for, for enabling free trade. So these are a lot of the things that often dominate our debate about where our economy is going uh, in New Zealand. Yet we, you know, we, we're doing very well. Um, and, and actually, this is, the, the, this is such a, um, a, a puzzle that economists have even given it a, a name, and they've called it the New Zealand paradox. Okay, so the New Zealand paradox is, 
here's a country that is doing all the things um, that we think are important for an economy well, and yet um, it's not doing so well, as, I, as I've seen before. And there was an OECD report that came out last year, uh, sorry, last week, um, and they, they estimate, based on where we sit in terms of the, the, the normal factors that we talk about that are important for our economy, that economists think are important for economic growth, we are about 40% poorer than we should be, um, uh, which, is, which, which is quite a puzzle, right? And so it's got this name, the New Zealand paradox. So I'm going to try and unravel this a bit for you today um, and, and think about how we might regain that, that 40% um, in, in terms of our economic growth. So part of, part of what I think is going on is what we do with our economy. Um, and this is, a, this is a plot of our exports. So these are the goods that we, we sell to the world. Um, and we're, we're exporting about $45 billion worth of goods um, every year. And as, as we know, we're very dependent on our primary sector exports, and in particular our, our, um, our, our milk powder. Right? It's, one of our, it's our largest export by, by value. Um, and and we, you know, we're doing very well in that area. We're selling an awful lot of that, particularly to, to China. But we do also have a manufacturing industry, and a manufacturing industry is only slightly um, smaller than our primary sector. Um, and, and, you know, in fact, it, it, it's doing reasonably well. But then I compare us to a country like Denmark, and suddenly you see, um, well, Denmark has a, a primary sector that's about the same size as ours, so they sell primary um, uh, products uh, to, to, to other countries, and they get about the same value as we do. But then look at their manufacturing sector. Um, it, it's three to four times the size of ours. And so a lot of the... A lot of um, uh, the, the gap between us and Denmark, Denmark's a, a country that's slightly bigger in terms of population than us, a lot of the gap between us and Denmark is, is just because they're selling uh, more goods to the rest of the world. And so this is, this is obviously, and, and I think this current government recognises this, we've got to lift our exports. Now, part of the debate is, is how should we do this, right? And, and there, is a, there is a school of thought that, that says we should do this, right? We should... We should grow the volume of our, of our primary exports, right? And, and there, are, there are plans and schemes out there to try and do this. Um, but there's, I think there's a problem with this. There's, a, there's, a, there's another paradox um, that, we, that we come up against when we, uh, when, we tr when we think about how we might do this. Part of the reason that, that our dairy industry has gone so well um, is because of this brand, right? We... we the rest of the world regards us as a clean, green country, and so we can sell uh, milk powder, which of course goes into infant formula, because consumers overseas believe that we're a, we're a safe, um, clean country um, uh, that produces clean food products. Um, but then, of course, you know, we, we can see things like this um, out in the New Zealand countryside. And in fact, there was a, just on the weekend, there was, there was a, two stories on the news. The first one was about... Um, was about uh, uh, <clears throat> the smell that was coming from, from a lake. I think it might have been Lake Rotoiti, the you know, um, uh, nitrification that caused the growth of a weed, and this weed was rotting. And the motel owner, who had a motel right on the lake, um, said that it smelt like a pig farm. And then the very next item was, was about how there was, there was a large untapped uh, tourist market for halal tourists from Muslim countries. So, you know, you, you can start to see there's a, there's a tension in what we're doing with our economy. The more we exploit our environment, um, the less we can rely on it to, for, for, for economic opportunities. And, of course, the rest of the world is starting to know this. It's not just something that, that, that Kiwis uh, are concerned about. The rest of the world, and, of course, you know, here's a, here's a clipping from the Herald. We always like to look at what the rest of the world is saying about us. Um, and that's something uniquely Kiwi as well, that we, that we write reports about other, other countries' newspaper reports. Um, but but here's, a, here's a headline that's talking about um, uh, a, a UK um, newspaper uh, rubbishing our clean green claims um, as pure manure. And so this, this is the sort of thing that has the potential to hurt our tourism sector. Um, but then, of course, there, there was also the, the, um, the, uh, the botulism uh, scare last year. Now, it turned out to be a false alarm, still a huge wake-up call for Fonterra, and there are still big mistakes made. Um, during, during that crisis. Um, but a you know, very interesting thing happened when this hit the news. Um, the New Zealand dollar, over the couple of days after that hit, after that hit the news, dropped three cents. Right? And so this was actually the rest of the world telling us that we're quite concerned you're so dependent on dairy products. 
Um, and, it, and it, you know, it turned out to be a, a, a guy inspecting a, a cooling tower, I think, and he broke his torch, and the glass um, came out of, his, out, out of the face of his torch, and that led to, you know, if you happen to be on holiday um, uh, at that time, you, you know, you, you may have lost a few hundred dollars um, uh, on your hotel bill uh, because of this, this guy um, cracking his torch in a cooling tower. So this is, this is the other problem with being so dependent on our primary sector, um, is it makes us very vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the very scary thing would be, say, a foot and mouth um, outbreak, uh, which would, you know, if you think this was bad for our dollar, something like that would be absolutely devastating. So I don't think that we can, while we, you know, there are opportunities to increase the value of our, of our primary sector, I don't think we can rely on it solely. I think we have to diversify and build other um, uh, exports into our economy, um, simply from a risk management point of view. So it's all very well to say this, how do we go about doing it? So, so that's what I want to talk about now. And so I'm going to use Denmark as an, as an example again. Um, and and I'll, I'll wind us back to 1995. And these box plots, these are just plots where the, little er where the area of the particular box tells, tells you this, it's related to the size um, or to the value of the particular export. So in 1995, um, our biggest export was lamb. Um, and if you look across here at Denmark, uh, Denmark's um, uh, big ex biggest export was bacon, okay, Danish bacon. Um, and so, you know, this reflects the fact that, that the primary sector is very important to both our economies um, 20 years ago. Um, and of course, you know, we've we've, we've, our economy has changed in response to, to changing markets. And in 2010, um, uh, our biggest export was, um, was milk powder. And, and of course, the, the growth of, of um, volumes of milk powder has continued till today. What happened in Denmark, its biggest export in 2010 was pharmaceuticals. Okay, so um, we've continued to rely on the primary sector. We've shifted from one primary sector good to another. Uh, Denmark's changed radically. Right? It's gone from bacon uh, to pharmaceuticals. And, and that's quite a big shift. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the big differences between these products um, is, the, is the number of countries that can make pharmaceuticals. Right? The number of countries that can, that can make milk powder is very large. Right? There's, a, there's a large number of countries that can do this, and it's growing all the time, right? because prices have been good for a long time. And so people are, people are getting better and better at this overseas. Um, pharmaceuticals are much harder to do. Right? They're much more difficult product to manufacture, there's much more knowledge that goes into it, that knowledge is much more difficult to acquire, um, and, and so these are, these are much more knowledge rich, which also means you have less competition, right? Uh, there are fewer parts of the world that can do this, um, and, and, and so that's why the, these, it's one of the ways in which these two products, these two exports differ. So how did the Danes do it? Well, they did it by spending on research and development. And you can see this happen, so here going back in 1980 through to 2010, this is the share of the, the percentage of their GDP that they spend on research and development. And, and in 1980 it was about 1%, which is a pretty typical um, uh, uh, spend back in the 1980s on, on research and development. A lot of countries uh, spent about this uh, in the OECD, but you can see that they've pushed this up to over 3% now. And a lot of European countries have goals now to take this to 4 or 5%. Um, and, and it's this sort of spending on research and development that's enabled them to develop these products that, that few other countries can. What's happened in New Zealand? Um, oh dear. <laughs> you can see why we're not producing products that, 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 um, that other countries can't. It's because our, um, our spend on, on um, research and development has stayed about the same. Right, you, may, you may remember the knowledge wave. Who remembers the knowledge wave? Um, yeah. <laughs> Amanda, who used to, you were probably in the ministry at, at that point. Right? So the knowledge wave, it's some, somewhere in here, it's a, it's a knowledge blip. Right? It really, um, we talked a lot about it, um, but we, we really didn't change what we were doing. Um, our, our level of R&D spending has stayed very, very static for a long period of time. And, it, you know, it, and starting from where the Danes were um, uh, 30 years ago. So I'll, you know, that's one of my messages tonight, is, that, is actually we need to put our money where our mouth is. If we want to transform our economy, we do need to invest. Um, and that's, that's both in the private sector um, and in the public sector. It's interesting to look at where we do put our R&D dollars. 
And this is, this is something that, that, that's also quite revealing. So this is the split into, what I've done is I've split the private spending, so the private spending is in blue, um, and the public spending, so that's the money the government puts in, is in red. And you'll see that actually the, most, of our, um, most of our private R&D um, goes into manufacturing and services. So they're now, they're now spending over a billion dollars a year, um, those industry sectors on research and development. Primary sector um, putting in about $150 uh, million dollars a year, and of course a lot of that comes uh, is through Fonterra. But look at where our, where our, um, uh, where our government spending goes. Right? For every dollar that, that the private sector spends in our primary sector, the government puts in about two. For every dollar that, our, that the private sector sends on manufacturing, the government's putting in about 30 cents. So there's quite a big mismatch as to where our public funding goes uh, uh, versus where our private funding goes. This has a big effect because, of course, one of the big roles of public sector funding is to train people, right? So we're producing a lot of people uh, w with skills that are relevant here through our, through our public sector spending, uh, but we're not producing those people in services uh, or in manufacturing. So I think that's, that's a real problem. What is it that these guys are doing? Right? I mean, it, it, this, this sounds, it, this is slightly depressing because it means that suggests the press, our government hasn't quite got it right. But what's exciting is the fact that actually our, 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 we've got businesses out there spending over a billion dollars a year um, on doing exciting new R&D. And what are they doing? Well, there's an awful lot of, of, of high tech going on. Um, and I've picked a few companies. Um, this is not quite random. I, I, I used to live in Wellington, so there's a little bit of a Wellington focus here, although I, I tried to be a bit, um, you know, I've, I've stuck in an Auckland company and a, and a Christchurch company and a, and a company from the Waikato just to, just to try and um, uh, uh, not show my Wellington bias. Um, but, you know, the companies like Magritech, this is actually a company that was founded by Paul Callaghan, makes portable NMR machines. So, so, you know, people who've had an MRI scan in, in a hospital know that those are very large machines that, that need a whole room and an operator. Uh, Paul's company uh, makes portable NMR machines that you can actually take, put in a backpack and take out into the field. Um, companies like HTS 110 uh, make high temperature superconductors. Uh, they make very powerful magnets uh, that can be used in, in MRI machines. Uh, we have companies like Buckley Systems. Buckley Systems, again, make very large magnets, they, they have an almost, mono, almost have a monopoly on the magnets that are used um, in, in um, silicon chip fabrication. There's a lot of companies that, like this, which you've probably never heard of, that are really world beating. And then we, you know, we do have companies that have come out of, the, out of our primary sector. And so, so Gallagher, for example, started out life making electric fencing. It now makes security systems um, uh, all around the world. You've probably used a Gallagher security system. Uh, and so, you know, now really a very high-tech um, uh, company. I'm really interested in, in where these companies come from, and then, you know, if, once they're started, what are their chances of success? And, and actually, the, the analogy that, that I've used, this was actually, um, I, I can't take uh, credit for this, um, is to talk about the innovation ecosystem. When I started out this stuff, I thought this was a bit of a buzzword. Um, I was, you know... It's just the sort of thing that management consultants say. So apologies to any management consultants here tonight. But, you know, it's, it's one of those words that sounds good, but what does it really mean? And, and actually, when I started this, I, I, um, I you know, I, I went, to, went to my boss at Callaghan Innovation and, and asked, well, could I get some funding to work on this? And he said, well, only if you call it the Innovation Ecosystem Project. Okay, now it was quite a good deal of funding, so I, I bit my lip, took the check, <laughs> and, and started this project. But actually, it turns out remarkably that there's some, that there's some very strong relationships, which, which, as I'll show you in a minute, between what's happening in the innovation ecosystem and what happens in a natural ecosystem. So first of all, I should, I should warn you that I'm a physicist, um, and so when I look at it, something like this, to me, I'm look, I, I, you know, I'm, I really want to see something like that. Right? I, I look at the world and I see data. Um, and so this is actually an ecosystem, um, and, and, and it's rendered in terms of, uh, in terms of data. Um, and, and what this, this data is, it's about the distribution of biomass within an ecosystem. Right? So um, and luckily, I didn't have to get this data. Um, there were some scientists in, in California who sent their students out into, into the forest and, and told them to count plants and estimate their mass. Right? So, um, up here, we have the large kauri or totara trees, or because it's Californian data, these would have been redwoods. 
right? And so these are, the, these are very massive. They have a large average, average mass, but there are not many of them in a forest, right? Typically, uh, there'll, there'll be a few of these very large trees. Okay, so their density will be very low. On the other hand, down here, we have you know, the grasses, the mosses, the ferns, the small shrubs. They don't individually weigh very much, right? so their biomass is not a lot, but there are a lot of them. Okay? So, so there's, there's a lot of mass in an individual kauri or totara tree, um, but there are not many of them. And there's also a lot of biomass in these smaller plants um, uh, because there are lots of them. Right? And the interesting thing is that they, when, when you plot this data on a graph, you see that this lies on this, on this straight line. Now, what's really interesting is if I do the same thing for innovating companies. Okay, and so I need a way to estimate the, the, the intellectual mass, if you like, of, of, a, of a company. So what I've done is I go out and count patents. Right? So I look at the number of patents that companies hold, right? and I use that to estimate the, the knowledge content that that, that, that company has. Um, and I can, I can look at how many companies have 100 patents, how many companies have 10 patents, how many companies have one patent. And when I plot this data, um, it almost falls on the, on the same line. Now, there's a, you can ask me at the end, there's a, there's, a, there's a slight trick in here. Usually it's only the physicists or the mathematicians that pull me out on this when I give this talk. There's a slight trick in this, but, but, but really, actually, this data uh, uh, follows exactly the same distribution. Right? There's... Um, uh, and what we have up here are the companies that have an awful lot of intellectual property, an awful lot of patents. Um, and down here we have the companies that, have, that are just starting out um, that only have a few patents. So a company like Magritech that was founded by Paul Callan about 10 years ago has a few patents. Um, it's got three or four now. Um, but there are a lot of companies that have three or four patents. Right? So, so although um, these companies are quite small, there are a lot of them. And then, up, and then at the... Um, up here at the top, we have companies like Fisher and Paykel Healthcare. Um, and, and using this measure, Fisher and Paykel Healthcare are actually the most knowledge-rich company that we, that we have in New Zealand. Um, they have the largest patent portfolio. And indeed, they're one of our largest technology companies. They have turnovers um, uh, of over $750 million um, dollars a year. Right? So there's a, there really is some meaning. You know, when we compare real ecosystems to innovation ecosystems, there's something to it. Now, that's kind of cute, right? It's a cute trick. Um, and it's the sort of thing that, that, if you're a professor of physics, you can write a nice paper about um, and get published in a journal. But is it actually any use? Well, it turns out it is, because you can use this to compare um, countries' innovation ecosystems, right? Just as we might look at a, at a forest um, and, and see whether that, that forest is healthy or not, we can use this measure to compare innovation ecosystems. And so what I've done is, I, is I'm comparing um, the data um, uh, for four countries here. I've got the United States, I've got Australia, I've got New Zealand, and I've got Finland. And so here's the New Zealand data. And actually, interestingly enough, you see that it sits um, the, roughly on, on top of the Australian data. Right? The Australian data kind of keeps going, um, probably because they're a larger country. So they just, you know, some of the companies just grow larger than ours. Um, but you'll see that the slopes are about the same. On the other hand, when you look at countries like the United States and Finland, um, you'll actually see that they've got steeper slopes. And actually, that's what you want. Right? A healthy innovation ecosystem would have a very steep slope because that means that the companies that are starting small, more of those companies are getting big and succeeding. Right? So the steeper the, the steeper the slope of your innovation ecosystem, uh, the more successful that ecosystem is. And so now we have a tool for comparing countries' ecosystems and we can also use this tool to try and figure out what's going on, what makes these, uh, makes these ecosystems different. So I'm going to give you one example. I'll we'll give you a couple of examples, actually. But the first one's going to be um, uh, Nokia. Right? So this is actually this is Nokia, uh, this data point. It's the company in Finland that has the most patents. Um, and actually, you know, Nokia's not doing so well um, these days. I don't know, has anyone got a Nokia phone? No one would, no, even if you had one, you're not going to admit it, right? Um, so they're not, they're not going so well, but certainly in terms, you know, from a Finnish perspective, uh, they're, they're a very successful company. Um, and actually, so it's really interesting to go in and have a look at what made them successful. And so we can zoom into this data point, and we can have a look at what's going on. Okay, and, and just in case you've forgotten what a Nokia mobile phone is, perhaps suggest tells us why they're not doing so well these days. Um, but, you know, I certainly had a phone like this, and probably 
a number of us would have owned phones like this. But, but actually, it was this, it was this phone that propelled them to the forefront of the world. And, and for a good, a good 15 years, they were, they were the dominant mobile phone um, uh, manufacturer. So what, what, what did it? Well, actually, there's a hint in Nokia's logo, connecting people. Right? And so, so I can zoom into that data point, which was that large collection of patents. And when the interesting thing about a patent, and this is why I use patents a lot in my analysis, is that it, on a patent, the inventors are named. Right? So I can figure out who worked on what. And, and interestingly, if, if, if you work on a patent with someone, right, you'll both be named on that as an inventor. And so actually, if I look at a patent and I see two or three people on that, I can, I can take a guess and, and assume that those, uh, those people have worked together. And so now if I've got this very large patent database, I can start to reconstruct how people work together. Right? And, and actually, here's, here's the group of people um, that put this phone together. Each of these dots is a person, um, and each of those lines is a, is a connection that I found between those people um, by, by seeing the fact that they've appeared on patents together. And there's actually there's 1,300 people um, in this network. Um, and so, so it took the efforts of about 1,300 Finnish engineers, ICT specialists, physicists, uh, scientists, designers, to put these phones together. So it starts to give you a sense. You know, if you want to produce something that no one else can, you actually need the scale. Not only scale, uh, you need collaboration. And this is, this, is, this is fairly typical. When we look at, at parts of the world that have been successful at, uh, at innovating, we always see these big collaborative networks. So now I want to go back, and I'm just going to we'll go back to these plots. I'm going to look at something that happens down here, right? Because uh, you know we want we would like to have an innovation ecosystem that is successful as that of the United States. So it's very interesting to see what happens when things start out down here. And I'm going to give an example. It's a company called Intuitive Surgical, and I'll use this example. It is an American company, uh, but one of its founders is a New Zealander, um, and her name is Catherine Moore. Um, she's a remarkable woman. Um, she's, got a, uh, she's got an MD degree and a PhD in engineering. Um, and, and I think this is her third company. And it, it's actually, I know I, I, I place it down here, but all, actually all the time, I've, you know, I've been giving this talk for, uh, for, for about a year now, it keeps moving up, right? It's doing very, very well. They now have their own building um, uh, with 60 or 70 people in it. So it's, so it's succeeding. What they do is they make robotic surgery devices. Um, so this is, this is the sort of device that if your doctor um, uh, is on the east coast of the United States and you're on the west coast, um, you know, she can, uh, she can uh, you know, provided the broadband is fast enough, she can dial in um, and operate on you on the west coast, right, and hope you've got a good service provider. Um, uh, but it, but it's, you know, it's the way that it's the, this is really the future of medicine because this means you can have the absolute best person in the world uh, for your particular type of operation working on you, and, they, and you don't have to go to them. Um, and so they, these types of technologies are becoming more common. What's really interesting about this, it's, it's not just the technology, um, is, the, is the collaborative network that Catherine's embedded in. Right? So when we, look, when we went to look um, at, at uh, the, the network, you know, this is a relatively small company making high-tech goods, but relatively small, only had a handful of patents. Uh, we found a huge patent network. Right? So turns out that although this is a small company, they're working in an ecosystem of uh, about 22,000 people, right? Um, you know, I, and, and this, this, it's, it's based on the, on the west coast of the US, stretches from uh, San Francisco, where Catherine's based, all the way down to San Diego, right? So there's, a, there's this ecosystem of people collaborating right across the west coast of the US, and, I, you know, I'd never heard of them, right? We, we, we know about Silicon Valley, but actually there's this huge network of people working on uh, medical device technologies. And, and none of the companies are very big. There is no large dominant player um, in, this, in this network. These are all small to medium medical technology businesses. Now, when I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to meet Catherine a few years ago, um, and I asked her, you know, what, what's your secret? You know, what, what, what goes on in your industry? And she was, she was a little bit startled that there, you know, that there was this big network here. But actually, you know, the, after a few minutes, she sort of, um, she sort of worked out and, and had a bit of a think. And what she says, well, you know, when anyone in my industry works, walks into my office, the first thing we do is work out our pedigrees, right? We, we, and they can trace themselves back to a common research group 
uh, 30 years ago in Stanford, right? And so this group of people has, has sort of sprung up um, from, a, from some R&D that was done at Stanford University 30 years ago, spawned all these companies, and everyone somehow has a connection back into this group. And I think this is an important part of collaboration, is the trust and social cohesion that that sort of interrelationship between people brings. So that's a, that's a, a, that's a key part, I think, of what makes this successful, um, is, is, is the trust and collaborate, trust that allows them to collaborate together, even though ostensibly these are companies that are competing uh, in this technology space. So now I want to, so that's, that's, we've looked at, at what's happening in the rest of the world. Now I want to come back to New Zealand and talk a little bit about New Zealand and how this is relevant to us. So actually, we've, what we've done in New Zealand is we've gone out and, and we've, we've looked at everybody who's filed a patent in the last 30 years. So I don't know if there's, there's usually one or two people that have filed a patent. Um, anyone here in Tauranga? We could look at our map. We could, it would take me a few minutes to find you. So put your hand... All oh, right, okay, we've got someone who, 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 over there who's got a patent. And, and we've, again, we've done the same thing. We've looked at who you've worked with. All right, so we've looked at who your co-inventors were, um, and, we've, and we've built this map of New Zealand to see how people are working together. Uh, and you'll see that actually we, we do work across regions. This is, this is actually something that's quite reassuring. We are collaborating across regions. Uh, but there's also some things that are quite sobering about this map that I think we have to learn from. And, and, and the first thing is that actually scale matters. Okay, so when we look at um, Dunedin, right, there's a cluster of inventors in Dunedin. And, and they collaborate and work together. But if I count up the number of patents um, and work out the number of patents per capita in Dunedin, I see that that's less than Christchurch. Okay? And when I count up the number of patents divided by the population to get patents per capita in Christchurch, I see that's less than Auckland. Okay? So Auckland has a higher number of patents per capita than Christchurch. Christchurch has a higher number of patents per capita than Dunedin. Right? So this is just not total patents, this is patents per capita. So Aucklanders are being more innovative, right, than the rest of And actually, I've just I've joined Auckland now, so, so I, can, I can claim I'm part of the most innovative part of the country. Okay, now that's, that, that's, that's um, maybe a little bit depressing if you're not in Auckland, but actually, people in Auckland should be depressed as well, because when we go to Sydney, we see exactly the same thing. People in Sydney are producing more patents per capita than people in Auckland. And when we go to Tokyo, we see the same thing again. People in Tokyo are producing more patents per capita than Sydney, right? So even if you're in Sydney, you should be worried. And this is actually seems to be a general thing, right? And we're, the, it was first noticed in cities in the United States, um, and exactly the same thing happens in the United States. The most innovative cities are also the largest cities. Um, and so this is, this is the sobering thing for New Zealand, because, of course, you know, Auckland isn't all that big, right, on a global scale. Um, uh, we, may, we may see it as the, as the potential powerhouse of New Zealand, but actually, it's, you know, it's only going to get us so far, right? It's not going to allow us to compete with the Sydneys or the Melbournes, even, in, even within our region. So the important thing, though, is to look at, well, why? Why are cities, um, are bigger cities, more uh, producing more patents per capita? Why are they more innovative? And, and this, is, this is where it gives us the potential to do something about it. So what we find now when we look in and, and, and look at the collaborations between people in cities, we find the same thing. The bigger cities are more collaborative. Um, you know, this may sound a little bit counterintuitive, right, we're, if we're in a small community and we, we kind of know each other, but actually it's the people in, in Auckland that have the densest network of collaborators. Um, and this is very, we think this is very closely, this is, this is close to the reason why um, Auckland produces more patents per capita and why Sydney produces more patents per capita and why Tokyo produces more patents per capita than Sydney is because people are working in denser networks. You, you, don't, you not only see it in patents, you can even look at, at mobile phone calls, right? So people can reconstruct. This is not work we've done, but uh, work done by a European group. They've reconstructed the network of how, how big and dense your networks are by looking at who you call on your mobile phone. And again, they find the same thing. In bigger cities, people are making use of bigger, denser networks. Uh, and, and so it's collaboration that's driving innovation in bigger cities. And so we... If we, can get, if we can figure out how to collaborate better and how to build uh, denser networks in New Zealand, I think that's, that's the answer for New Zealand. And so that's really my, my first take-home message. I'm going to go through my little uh, uh, prescription now of, of what I think we need to do. And, and so actually, you know, it's all very well having uh, policies that focus on Auckland, 
Um, uh, but actually, what we need to do is, is concentrate on building a city of 4 million people. It's not enough for us to just work regionally, right? We just don't have that density um, of, of people in our regions. We really have to connect ourselves nationally and take advantage of all 4 million people in the country. And actually, you know, perhaps not enough to do that even, right? We have to become better connected to the rest of the world. Uh, that, that's, that's absolutely crucial. We, we, we need to make sure that we know what's going on in overseas markets so that we can get um, uh, value-added products to them on time. We also need to know what's happening technologically so that we can exploit that technology to do new things with it here. So, you know, sometimes I talk about connecting, reaching out to the other million New Zealanders overseas and building those networks so that we're well connected with the rest of the world. Now, it's not enough to just connect with each other, right? It's all very well. We, could, we can all meet up and, and have a drink um, and, and chat about the weather, right? We actually need to start exchanging ideas. Um, and, and this is something that I think, you know, when I go and talk to, to people, that they often feel that New Zealanders are not very good at, at, at bringing out our ideas, right? We're often a bit reserved, reluctant to put stuff out there uh, because we're perhaps afraid of being told it's, it's wrong. Um, and so we tend to sit on things and polish our ideas up until perhaps too late, right? Till we, uh, they're too late to really be exploited. Or if they were a bad idea, right? Better to be told early on that it's a bad idea and this is why it won't work than to, than to sit on that idea um, and keep working on something that, that's flawed. So actually, I think we need to get more comfortable with sharing our ideas, um, with, with, with building teams around our ideas and, and not trying to develop things on our own. And of course, that's a key part of collaboration, is openness. So that's a key thing. All right, I'm a, I'm a scientist, okay? So it's in my, it's in my contract, I think, to, to wherever I go, say we need more funding. Um, but I showed you that, that you know, it, it is true. Countries that succeed at this game actually spend more money, right? So we do need to invest, and that's both the government and our private sector. We need to lift, lift investment uh, in generating knowledge. And then my last point, I'm just going to give you it's going to tell you, compare two New Zealand innovations, and, and, and um, I'll try and draw a, draw a point from this. And the first <coughs> New Zealand innovation um, is, is Icebreaker. It's actually, you know, it's been a very, very successful brand for New Zealand. You know, Jeremy Moon um, has, has, has done very successfully for that. And if you look, really, you know, the, the innovation came about through his, his very clever marketing, how to, how to take merino wool um, and sell it in a new way uh, to a new market. And very, you know, very, very clever. And it is, it's based on the merino wool fibre, right? And you know, so we know we can grow wool. We know we're good at that, right? And we just need to do a little bit more marketing. And we could, we could build an industry based on that. Um, so that's, that's something that most New Zealanders feel we should be able to succeed at. Um, you know, it, it uh, was thought up on, the, on an island in the Marlborough Sounds. What better part of New Zealand, you know, to go uh, think about a, a, a new industry um, than, than in the Marlborough Sounds? Um, and today, it's actually, I, I'm not entirely sure what its turnovers are, but the last numbers I got were about $100 million. And I know, you know, Jeremy Moon has a, has, a, has a goal to take this to a billion, right? He wants to grow that by an order of magnitude. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I wish him very good luck. I just want to compare that to an, another New Zealand innovation. Actually, it's got, this has now given rise to a company um, that's worth $3 billion US dollars. It's got revenues of $3 billion US dollars. Um, and it was an idea, it was come up with, came up with in Auckland. Um, and it's based on something called expanded polytetrafluoroethylene. Um, does anyone know what that is? I heard, I heard it somewhere over here, someone said te Teflon. It is, it's Teflon, but something special has been done to it, it's been expanded. Actually, it's, it's stretched Teflon, right? So, um, so what, the, what the guy, the chap did in Auckland, is he figured out how you could take a piece of te Teflon, stretch it, so that you, you perforated it. Um, does anyone want to guess, guess what the product is? Hmm? No, it's Gore-Tex. Um, it turns out Teflon doesn't like water, right? It's water repellent. So you, um, so you stretch Teflon, you get these little holes, right? So water vapour can go through the small pores, but large droplets of water like rain can't get through because the Teflon repels it. So this is, this is, this is Gore-Tex. And a New Zealander was the first person to come up with the technique um, for making, uh, making this waterproof, breathable fabric. Okay, it turned out it's, an, it, 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 it's a long story. 
um, as to why, why we didn't uh, successfully exploit this. But I, I like to, um, you know, to, to cut it short. It's like, well, we know in New Zealand we're good at selling wool. We're not so sure about selling. You know, why, why on earth would this succeed in New Zealand? Um, we know why this would. Why would, why would stretch Teflon? And, and so that was part of the thinking, unfortunately, that led to this technology um, being successfully commercialised in the US, um, is, is because this, this doesn't sound like the sort of thing New Zealanders would sell. Um, yet, if you think about the market for Gore-Tex and Icebreaker, um, you know, if you own a piece of Icebreaker, I'm pretty sure you own a piece of Gore-Tex. Well, these days, of course, there's lots of different fabrics, so the markets are the same. Um, and and uh, so it's a, you know, a, a real loss for New Zealand. And so I'll, just kind of, I'll sum up by just looking, you know, how do these two companies market themselves? And I think there's a lesson for us in this. And of course, you know, Jeremy Moon's marketing, very, very clever. Right? He's won a lot of awards for this, and, and a, this is no doubt um, part of the secret of why he's been successful at this game. And you know, if, you, if you go look at his marketing, um, yes, yeah, sure, there's, there's always a few slightly odd-looking people um, in, in the foreground, you know, suggesting perhaps a little bit too much inbreeding um, going on in some parts of New Zealand. But, but also, he makes tremendous use of the New Zealand landscape, right? He's, you know, these people are in this fantastic, brooding, um, beautiful landscape, right? And, and so, you know, and of course we know, we, we, we use our environment, we use our land to sell our products, right? And he's, been, he's very cleverly um, uh, exploited that to, to sell the Icebreaker brand. Right, now look at the brilliant marketing strategy of Gore-Tex. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all they're saying is that this is, this is a product that works. <laughs> and you'll probably want to buy it because it will keep you dry. Right? They don't need a, a clever marketing strategy right? because, the, the, because knowledge has gone into their product and they're selling a product that, that people, will, people will want to use because it's of, of its utility. And I think that the, you know, the, the take-home message for me from this is that Sure, right, there are, we, we, there are times when we can make use of our environment, and we should if we can do it in a sustainable way. On the other hand, right, we, we also have the opportunity to take advantage of our brains and our know-how. And, and we've got to do a lot more about, of telling the world that we're clever, right, and we can come up with innovations and products that no one else can. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. We shouldn't always have to rely on our environment to do that work for us. Right? We should just be tell, able to tell the rest of the world that we have products here that, that you know, are unique um, and that people will want to buy. So that's really my last point, is that we need to see ourselves as a people of knowledge, not just people of the land um, and people who exploit our environment. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'll, just put up, I'll leave the shameless plug for the book up there. It's going for a very reasonable price at the back of the room. Um, and I believe we can take um, a few uh, questions. So thank, thanks for being an attentive audience. So question. I'm not sure that, oh, it is working, great. So questions for Sean, from anybody? Hands. Thank you. Uh, I, I worked in Finland for a while at a university and one of the key things there to their success was collaboration between government, university, yep. and industry. So I just want, <clears throat> wondered if you could comment on that for New Zealand. Yeah, that, I mean, that really, um, that really stands out. Um, uh, and all the Scandinavian countries, I think, do that really well, and, and I think that's a key part of why they've done so successfully economically. I mean, you, you, uh, you know, I show that, that picture of those, those Finnish um, engineers, and you th you've got to think about, well, where do those guys come from? And... and so the first time I looked at that, I thought, well, you know, they, they, started, they started appearing, right? If you, you can sort of run the time, so you can run a movie of those guys as they, you know, year by year as they come together and start working together, and you can watch this movie. And for a while I thought, well, yeah, sure, you know, the Soviet Union's collapsing, right? So all these clever Russian engineers are, 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 are emigrating um, and, 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 you know, working for Nokia. But, I, you know, I couldn't find any Russian names. You know, the one thing about studying Finland is you can tell a Finnish name, right? And, and I couldn't find any Russian names. And then I actually looked at what was going on in the universities. And, and, and uh, in the late 1980s, we produced more electronics engineers than Finland. Um, by the end of that, by 15 years later, they were producing 10 times more than we were from their universities. Um, so they, you know, the, the, we, would, we would struggle... I mean, I know Stevens Joyce is trying to push us and 
product to, to increase um, uh, the number of engineers coming out of universities, and, and, and actually it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a struggle. We don't have, the, we don't have those relationships, um, you know, firstly between government and, and universities. You know, they just tend to want to bicker back and forth. Um, and then also, you know, we don't have good enough connections between our universities and the businesses, right? We, we're, not, we're not good at reading what, what are the skills, and, and I think actually, you know, industry is not good at telling universities what are the skills that, that, that they're going to need in 10, 15 years. And so the, you know, so we're, I don't think we're able to pull off the kind of cooperation between our different actors in our system that the Scandinavians are yet. I mean, another anecdote, we had a, it was, a, it was a conference I went to. It was around data sharing. So it was around uh, a, it, just parts of government sharing, sharing different types of data so that they could make better decisions. And this Danish guy gave this presentation, and they've got all this great data sharing going on, and they're uh, doing all this, you know, the government's becoming smarter, uh, the, it, it, the, it's able to spend less money on, on welfare, etc. cetera. Um, and, and the New Zealanders in the room were incredulous. And, you know, someone asked, well, how on earth did you do that? And this Danish guy was just puzzled. And he said, oh, we just asked. Um, and we don't, <laughs> that doesn't seem to work in New Zealand. <laughs> um, so I do think we've got a lot to learn about how the Scandinavian countries work together. Next question. I just wonder if you've got any comments about what's happened in China. I mean, they have obviously have a huge impact on the world and they've had huge changes. So can we learn from that? Um, I mean, I, I think we, you know, I mean, they, they, they're coming from a very different place from us, um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of different forces shaping what's going on in China, and of course, the, the scale of China, and you've, you've, you know, you've seen, I've, I've given you some hints as to how important scale is, and you can see all these things starting to happen in China. You can see uh, collaboration, I mean, um, starting, starting to take place. We, we, we see this in South Korea as well, right, so you saw that saw how South Korea's gone. And, and, and again, collaboration was a key part of what they did. We can all, we, we, we've also looked at collaborating between companies. right? So we can look at when companies share um, intellectual property, when they co-own intellectual property because they've, you know, they've worked together on, on, on some piece of um, innovation. And again, we, we, you know, that's, that, that seems to be a signal if, you're, if your innovation ecosystem is, starting off, is, is kicking off and doing really well, you start to see the number of collaborations between companies. Um, actually increasing, and we're starting to see that in China. And of course, China China's spending more and more on research and development. That's tracking up. Um, you know, it won't be too long before they're doing most of the science in the world. There's some real issues, perhaps around quality of the science that they're doing. Um, but there's certainly some parts, you know, of 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 science, the science and innovation system in, in China that are that are uh, you know are, are taking off at phenomenal rate. Um, so so I think. You know, when I look at China, the, the phenomena are very much the same, right? We're seeing the same sort of things, same sort of patterns starting to develop. And, and I, th you know, I think they'll, they'll, they'll track much like um, South Korea in terms of how their innovation ecosystem works. One more question. Andrew. Uh, Sean, I'm interested to know, have you noticed any difference in the reception of your message when it's presented to people from academic, uh, commercial, or governmental bodies? Ah, um, yes. <laughs> I'm the most deadpan audience for Treasury. <laughs> um, they didn't laugh at any of my jokes. Um, um, so, um, I, uh, you know, I think... I think it's kind of quite interesting. So, so I, I do work with a lot of economists, um, and and I, I do I see two types of reaction to the type of thing I'm talking about, and it and often depends on their background. I mean, so so really, what the way I'm looking at things is is very very much based in this in this economic geography idea, the idea that place matters, um, and that's where a lot of these ideas about scale and agglomeration come from. So, the, the economists that have a background in that. Um, love this stuff and get quite excited about it, and, and I'm working with them today. Those that haven't seen this stuff, and, and actually that's, as far as I can tell, seems to be the majority of New Zealand practicing economists anyway, um, find it a little bit hard to, um, uh, to deal with. And that's why it's, it's still a paradox. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's a paradox. I think we can, we can explain why New Zealand hasn't, hasn't performed as well, and it's because of the way that 
<clears throat> and I ha- haven't got into that so much tonight, but, but the way that we're producing knowledge is, is changing, right? Um, uh, you need more people. Uh, you need um, deeper skills to generate new knowledge these days. And that, that's, that's changing. And, and it, it's also that there's a, you know, we think now that we've got a lot of collaborative technologies, we've got broadband, we've got, we, you can Skype people, um, that, that that should allow us to beat distance. But in fact, face-to-face um, uh, it seems to be becoming even more important. Right? In a way, it's because the, the types of knowledge that you can exchange by email, you know, you can, by reading Wiki, you know, the things you can get by reading Wikipedia, or the stuff that's available to you electronically, well, it's available to everybody else as well. So it's less, that type of knowledge is less valuable. It's the really difficult stuff that really requires face-to-face communication and a lot of dialogue that's become more valuable. And that's why big cities are becoming even more important. And so I think that's something that, that an economic geographer gets, but perhaps not um, your average uh, economic analyst. Um, I, I, I mean, generally I'm getting a really good response. I mean, it's really positive. I mean, even, even from the, you know, I beat up the dairy sector and the primary sector a little bit in this talk, um, but actually they do realise that, that they've got to innovate, right? I mean, I, I don't think this is a, you know, the, but the message that we've got to innovate, that we've got to be smarter, um, that we've got to get, you know, we, we can't keep relying on, on intensification um, and, and exploiting our environment, I think most New Zealanders have now got. Um, and so actually I get a very positive um, reception from, from uh, primary sector industries. I'm, you know, I've talked to forestry, I've talked to some of the uh, people in, in, in dairy are very positive, um, and I think I've, my, one of my next get off the grass will be to the red meat industry. Um, so, um, so actually, people are picking up on this. And of course, you know, if, if the rest of us become more innovative, that's got to be good for our primary sector, right? Because we'll be developing technologies um, in the rest of our economy that they can use to make their, uh, make their products more innovative and make their, the, you know, the work they do more productive. Um, so generally, you know, very positive response. And it, you know, the Aucklanders probably switch off you know, where, where, you know, where I start talking about the rest of the country, you know, they're probably quite happy to, to be just the most innovative. Um, but actually, no, I think, I think Auckland gets it that, as well, that they actually have to, uh, they, they can't just do it themselves. So that was a bit of a long-winded answer to that question. Tess. Kia ora, Sean. Thank you for your um, kōrero. It was really interesting. And, and now, I'd just like a comment. In, in the uh, Māori economy is a, a $37 billion economy. And as opposed to the um, treaty claims coming back, 67% of that economy is with whānau, small whānau businesses. So the economy of scale that you're talking about, what, what would your comment be about that, that in moving that economy forward? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think the message is very much the same, that, that, um, uh, that we've got to, you've got to collaborate and innovate. And again, you know, uh, uh, we've got to do it as a, as a whole country, right? And, and, and I think there are, you know, there are certainly different parts of, of, of our economy that, that, you know, would need some unique thinking about. But actually, we all have to go forward together. We've all got this problem. Uh, and actually, I, I mean, I do think the, the, the Māori economy, there's, there's huge opportunity um, uh, because we perhaps, you know, it has been very primary sector um, uh, based, uh, and I think there's huge opportunity to, to, um, uh, to change perhaps that um, and, to, and to innovate more. Um, but we've got to do it, you know, we, we can't leave anybody behind. You know, we're only four million people. Um, we, we, we would, I don't quite, I mean, I think we're about the same as Sydney, right? We, we'll, we, we, we can't compete with these big overseas cities if we don't all um, move forward and, and all collaborate. So I think that's my that's my message is, is really, you know, it's about openness and it's a, it's a, it's about sharing of ideas and trust. And I think if we can if we can do that, um, then we'll all go forward and succeed. And relationships, yeah. And, I th- and actually, I think I think that's a that's a real advantage that that, that perhaps Maori have. You know, the the, um, the 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 depth of trust and the and the um, established relationships that perhaps the rest of the country could learn from. Um, about how we do that. So, one more, one more. 
sorry. Um, <coughs> Uh, Sean, you probably know that we have here in um, the Bay of Plenty, in Tauranga actually, um, at a coastal marine research institute within Waikato University. Just been hearing about that tonight, actually. Uh, um, and um, uh, the, um, uh, the, that originated in a collaboration with the University in Bremen, in Germany, uh, and has now um, uh, formed a new collaboration with China. Uh, the research, as you probably now know, is generating potential for... Um, uh, products like pharmaceuticals. So my question is whether it is enough in terms of economic prosperity to be the knowledge producer if we can't be the manufacturer um, and using your comparative examples with relative size of primary versus manufacturing. Um, I, I, I think you can be very successful um, uh, at, at producing knowledge. I mean, I think, I think that, that, that certainly... Um, you know, we're always going to be producing goods um, but actually, I think you can su succeed very well at producing knowledge. And if you look, you know, one of our, I, I think, you know, the digital economy, um, we've got huge potential. When you think about that, you know, we're not really, um, we're not shipping goods, we're, we're shipping knowledge um, and information. And so, so I think you can succeed in this, as an economy that's very knowledge based. And I think, again, um, uh, you know, some of the small Scandinavian and European countries do that really, really well. And so I, I do think that's, that, that's somewhere we can go. And it, and it is, you know, it is manufactured products um, are that much harder to get to your market. And, and one, of, one of the disadvantages for New Zealand is our distance um, from our markets. And getting, you know, we, we all wonder why the logs sit on the wharf um, and just get shipped out without us doing anything to them. And it's because actually we find it really hard to react to market opportunities, right? So if we turn that into a chair... Um, in New Zealand and ship that to market, it doesn't arrive at the right time at the right place with the right design. And so that's why our logs um, go off. So actually, you know, if, if we can work in spaces uh, where we, 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 you know, in spaces like the digital economy where we can be much more responsive to what's going on uh, in the marketplace, then I think we can, we can do very well. Thank you, Sean. Would everybody like to give Sean Hendy a big round of applause for coming down to Toronto this evening?